Hi everybody, so today we're going to talk about regression models and specifically today we're going to focus on linear regression. It looks really complicated, but really if you pay attention to how to interpret things correctly in context and then also get really comfortable with using your calculator, you'll be fine. So there are a lot of steps. I would encourage you to pull up the worksheet that goes along with this video that's also called Lesson 3-2 and 3-3, and we're going to walk through a typical problem using the calculator and um, interpreting the results. So we see scatter plots everywhere, right? So scatter plots are used to relate two quantitative variables along an x and a y axis. It's a coordinate pair that's plotted on a typical grid. Um, some of you right now are in the process of, of applying to colleges, and some of the research you might be doing is what GPA and what SAT or ACT do I need to get into a particular school? So if you're doing research, say on Georgia Tech, um, you'll see a scatter plot, and the scatter plot relates the SAT and the GPA along the y-axis here of students who have applied. And you'll notice that there's a bunch of different colors on this particular scatter plot. So in this case, this is an example of a graph that's actually using multiple variables, categorical variables combined in with a typical scatter plot. Um, the green squares represent students who applied and were admitted. The green diamonds represent students who were applied and deferred and later admitted. Um, the, the red did not get in, and then the blue were deferred and then later denied. So in our case, we are just going to focus on a typical scatter plot. There will not be any kind of categorical values associated with it, but that is a possibility. So let's say we're just interested in the students who were accepted, and we'll restrict our data for um, the years 2016 to 2020. So you want to look at your scatter plot before you do any type of regression model. You always want to look at the pattern of the data and describe the, the distribution. So we are looking for the form, the strength, and the direction of our data set in context. So a couple of things we might note. First of all, it's telling us here the accepted average GPA is 4.49. That's kind of crazy high, right? But, um, and then the average combined SAT is 1,500. And you'll see that those two are um, denoted as the, the blue bars here. Um, and you'll see that that goes pretty much right through the middle of our cluster of points, which would make sense. So you can see how the data is clustered right up here, but do we have a few unusual points that we need to address? So you want to address any outliers or potential influential points. So this is definitely one, right? So this student was accepted, had an SAT of 1030 and a GPA of 3.22. Here's a few other influential points or outliers here. So notice that if, if there is a point that is unusual in the x direction of variables, in other words, it's outside of the typical cluster from an x perspective, that is a possible influential point in our data set. And we'll talk about that more as we go. If something is just unusual it's part of our general cluster here, but this SAT score of 1530, which is pretty high out of 1600, right? That's really high. It's 3.52 is a pretty good GPA, but relative to all the other points of representing the students who were accepted in these particular years, um, this student has an unusually high SAT score given their lower relative GPA. So when you're describing your data set, make sure that you always point out those unusual values. So let's look at a more typical problem that you might see in statistics, either on the AP exam or in a class, on a worksheet. So in this particular example, you're given a set of data. It's two quantitative variables that are related on an individual. 
In this case, it's literally an individual. It's an individual student, but it could be um, any kind of ordered pair where you have an X and a Y component. So in this problem, students were asked to log the amount of hours that they studied for a recent exam. The hours studied and the exam score in points are recorded in the table. Then you're asked, is there any kind of relationship between the hours studied and the score on the exam? Construct a model to predict the score, the exam score from the hours studied. So first you need to decide what is my explanatory variable and what is my response variable? In this case, it's pretty easy, right? So hours studied, we're gonna use that to try to predict what a student's score could be on their final exam. So before we get much further, I just want to encourage you to refer to the notes on the top phrases to memorize. So eventually we'll have 10. Right now we have five, and you want to focus on these that refer to regression. So when you're asked to calculate the least squares regression line, the slope, the y-intercept, correlation coefficient, coefficient of determination, and S, the standard deviation of the residuals, you should refer back to this in terms of how to interpret it correctly, always in context. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, always, step one, always plot your data. So you can enter your data in your list one and your list two in your graphing calculator and create a graph. So just remember that you always need to show your titles, and your labels and then plot your axes accordingly. So still you're going to look for any kind of patterns and deviations and outliers influential points in your data set and look and see does it does your data set appear to be linear? Does it possibly follow a curved pattern? Does it not have any pattern at all? It just looks kind of like a shotgun blast all over the place. So you're really only wanting to come up with a least square regression equation or what we call a model if the data is linear. And so the only way we're gonna know that is to actually plot our data. So when we plot our data and we enter it in list one and list two in our graphing calculator, changing the scale or the window settings of the graph can really make a big difference in what your picture looks like. And it can influence whether your brain thinks that the data is really strongly clustered together or not. So you'll notice the graph on the left um, has a different Y scale than the graph on the right. So the graph on the, on the left starts at zero and goes to 100, but it breaks at, it goes from zero to 50 and then starts incrementing in, um, in increments of 10 points, whereas the graph on the right starts at zero with no break and goes zero, 20, 40, and so forth every 20 points. So you'll notice that we like to include what we call a shark bite or a break in the graph to show that the distance between zero and 50 is different than every other increment on the y-axis. So that's important when you're putting your, your graph on paper. So before we do any kind of equation, we're gonna describe the relationship between our two variables. And notice that the question a lot of times doesn't include any context because that context is given to you in the prompt above. But every time you do this, you wanna make sure and describe the strength, form, direction, and include context of the problem. So in this case, we might say there's a strong, positive, linear relationship between a student's exam score and the hours in time that the student studied for that exam. And then we wanna note any unusual points. Well, in this case, this point off to the right that is Margaret's score, if you go back to the original data, which is that she studied about six hours and received a 96 on her test, which was much better than the rest of the students. So we need to go ahead and identify that as a somewhat unusual point in our data set. So we're going to use our graphing calculator, enter our data in list one and list two. Okay, so when we're working with our calculator, one of the first things we need to do is turn the stat diagnostics on. So you want to press mode on your calculator under the quit button here. 
and then scroll down to stat diagnostics right here and it defaults to off so you need to click the arrow key to go over to the right and then hit enter and then just stat um, just second quit out of there and then that will enable the r and r squared to show up when you do your calculations so we've entered our data in the calculator here from our problem so I have my X values in list one and my Y values in list two. Make sure you keep those together as a coordinate pair because you can't sort your list or anything like that. It would get all messed up and out of whack. So keep those together. And then I'm going to click stat. Go over to the right to click on calc. And then note that there are two linear regression options here. There's a number four and a number eight. We want number eight because that is just more appropriate for statistics class. We start with the y-intercept first in the equation instead of slope. So um, the other thing is you want to make sure that your calculator is pointing to the correct list one and list two for your x and y. And I always like to store my regression equation here as I go. And to do that, just hit alpha F4, and it brings up all of these options for my Y values. I just hit enter and put it in Y1, and then arrow down to calculate, hit enter, and it brings up all my values. So I have A is my Y intercept, B is the slope, R squared is the coefficient of determination, and R is the correlation coefficient. And because we stored our equation, in y equals, when I click on y equals, it will put that whole equation without rounding into the y1 so that when I go to graph my data, I hit graph, the line, the regression line now shows up in addition to all of the points that I've used. So if you haven't graphed your data yet, what you need to do is go to second stat plot Make sure your stat plot for number one and only number one is turned on. So select that, hit enter, and then hit enter again on on and use your arrow key to arrow down to that very first graph option here. That's my scatter plot. Again, make sure it's pulling from the correct list and then you can hit graph. And then if you want to adjust your window settings, remember if you use zoom nine, zoom stat down here, that adjusts your graph to be fairly appropriate for a statistical graph, but it might not be easy to translate this graph back to the piece of paper that you're working with. So if you go to window, you can change your settings. Um, the X values look okay for us. Um, our biggest X value is six. So I usually start with slightly negative and that way it shows the Y axis there on my graph. My scale, so in other words, how much the X axis will increment is one. And now the Y value, these are a little wacky. So I might wanna change those and say, maybe make my X value minimum 40 and the Y value could be um, 110. And then my scale for my Y value, how much that increments will be 10. So once I do that, I can click, click graph again. And then, you know, you can hit trace. It will trace through each of these X, Y combinations, the coordinate pairs in the order that I entered them in my list, which is kind of nice. And notice it's showing the values down here. So um, that's kind of a handy tool as well. So, and then we were gonna select stat calc and number eight in our linear regression, and we're gonna get our equation. So you wanna make sure and define your explanatory and response variables in context in your equation. So um, note that the little tent there over the Y value means predicted Y, or in, in this case, predicted exam score is equal to 59.0257, that's my y-intercept, plus 6.6767, which is my slope, times, in parentheses, the study hours. So you can use the letters x and y, but if you do, you still have to define your variables 
And don't forget that you always need the little hat over your y variable. So we have our equation, and now we're probably going to be asked to plot the equation of the regression line on our scatter plot. So again, you want to use your window settings on your calculator and adjust those as needed so it's easy to translate your graph from your calculator back to your paper. You always want to make sure that your line, the equation line, passes through the X bar, Y bar. So um, to get those values, you can do stat, calc, two variable stats, and it will bring up both the, um, the basic statistics for your X list and your Y list. And it gives you enough information there that you can get the X bar and Y bar. The easiest way to get X bar, Y bar, go back to stat, Go to calc and now go down to number two, two variable statistics with list one, list two, no frequency list. And this brings up enough statistics about both of my lists and it has what I need. So all I need is this X bar, my X average, 2.18. And then down here, it gives me the Y, the Y average. So in this case, our least square regression line needs to pass through the point 2.18 and 73.8. And then you just want to make sure that your y-intercept is approximate, um, at least close to what it should be. Okay, so then next, you're always going to be asked a lot of questions about identify and interpret the key components in context of the problem. So definitely slope, y-intercept, correlation coefficient, and coefficient of determination, you need to refer to that words to memorize note sheet we talked about in order to interpret these correctly and just don't forget your context. So these problems happen all the time and you should definitely pay attention to that words to memorize. You can get off of those a little bit but we found that sometimes when students don't use that to interpret their um, components in context, they're going to forget key information. Okay, so slope. Remember slope on the words to memorize. It says for every one unit increase in the explanatory variable, our model predicts, keyword predict, an average, important word, average, increase of y units in the response variable. So in context of this problem, for every additional hour a student studies, our model predicts an average increase of, fill in the slope value, 6.6767 points on the student's exam score. Next we have y-intercept. So here are the words from our sheet of words to memorize. So in context, we would say when a student does not study for the exam, or they study zero hours in this case, our model predicts their exam score will be about 59.0257 points, or about 59 points if we're rounding to the nearest whole number. Okay, next we need to interpret the correlation co coefficient r, which we're going to get from our output from our graphing calculator. And remember, r is measured on a scale from negative 1 to positive 1, where 0 means there's no correlation at all. So in this case, um, we would want to say that the correlation coefficient, and give the value, in this case it's 0 0.864, shows that there's a strong positive linear relationship between time studied in hours and the exam score in points. Note you always need to use the word linear when you're interpreting R, even if later in this chapter when we get to curved distributions of data, R is still measuring a linear relationship. So it's very important you use that word linear. And then last we'll interpret the R squared, which is the coefficient of determination. And remember, that is um, showing the percent of the variation in your Y value. So how much Y is changing, um, how much of that change in Y that can be predicted by the linear model showing the change in X. So with R squared, we always show that as a percentage. So in this case, 
give the value r squared equals 0.747, meaning that approximately 75% of the variation in exam scores can be explained by the approximate linear relationship with the time spent studying. Now, note that that also tells us that 25% of the variation in exam scores can't be explained by our model. So our model is not good at explaining those points. And so it's important that you understand that the R squared is referring to the variation in Y. So how much Y is changing um, based on our linear model that we've developed between exam score and our study. So once we've interpreted all of our values that are used in our model, model just being another word for equation, we're gonna be asked to use our model to predict certain values. So that's the whole point. That's the whole reason we created an equation is to predict values for Y given X. So we don't need to predict the test scores of our current students that we started with we want to use our equation based on our sample of students we use to develop this model to predict values of y that we don't know. So in this case, we might want to predict the exam score for a student who studies for three hours and 30 minutes. If I'm trying to find the value for a specific x, Remember, since we stored our equation in y1 here, I can do alpha trace that pulls up my equation, and then I can plug in the value of x, three and a half hours in this case, and hit enter. So it's basically like saying f of x. So it's the function of x when it equals, when x equals 3.5, and this gives me my y value based on that equation that's entered in my y1. So we would plug x equals 3.5 into our equation and find our value of y, which in this case is 82.74. So that's all I'm gonna talk about for right now, um, it, just because I don't wanna keep you too long. But our next lesson, which follows this, will be on residuals and residual plots, and we'll keep going with the same exact data and same problem so you already have it in your calculator. Thanks, and have a great day.